Welcome to the Bernie's Bootlegs Podcast, where we explore the stories of successful musicians and share their perspectives on being an artist in a digital age. I'm your host, Kenny McCabe, and let's get into the show. Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by you. If you would like to support the show, head over to berniesbootlegs.com forward slash support. Every contribution will go towards the production costs and overhead of running the podcast. Your support is greatly appreciated and will ensure I can keep making episodes into the future. Thanks, everybody, and enjoy the show. In today's episode, we're speaking with pianist, composer, and arranger Stephen Feifke. We discussed his early years, how he taught himself to arrange, what inspires him, his process for composing, and much more. You can find Stephen on his website at stephenfeifkemusic.com and also on Instagram at stephenfeifke. And so without further ado, I bring you my conversation with Stephen Feifke. All right, guys, I'm here with Stephen Feifke. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Sure, no problem. How are you, man? Good, yeah, thanks for having me, man. Everything's cool. It's my pleasure, and um, if... uh, for people watching this, uh, you are currently munching on some cottage cheese, is that? Yes, I'm glad you brought that up, so now I can feel okay about taking another bite. <laughs> exactly, and uh, for people listening to the audio version, um, I don't think it will be too too intrusive, but um, if you're watching the video on, on YouTube, then um, don't don't be alarmed, we're, we're, we're humans. And so, uh, yep. yeah man, so what have you been up to? You just got back from Japan, which I'm mm-hmm. sure was super exciting. Was that your first time in Japan or no? Yep, yeah, it was my first time in Japan. Very cool trip. Um, had some difficulties with transportation because I got there on the day that the typhoon hit. Um, the most recent typhoon, Hajibis, or however you pronounce it. Um, but aside from that, very cool trip. Yeah, awesome to be in Japan. Yeah, man. What exactly were you over there for? I saw you kind of doing like a masterclass type type thing. Yeah, most. Uh, yeah, mostly performances. I think we did three masterclasses while I was there, and then I was a guest with two big bands. So I was conducting and playing my music, and then I was uh, the person who put the tour together, Tomohiro Mori, a drummer who lives in New York, went to Berkeley, but was born and raised in Fukuoka in Japan put together a trio with um, Luke Selleck on bass and myself on piano. So yeah, very fun, very fun musical trip as well as a great hang. Yeah, man, absolutely. And uh, I I understand you're battling some, some jet lag at the moment. So if anyone listening to this finds that you sound mildly unenthused or mildly, (laughs) uh, I don't know what the right word is. uh, I get that a lot, actually. That might not have to be with, to do with the jet lag. (laughs) Doesn't mean I'm not enjoying our conversation. Perfect. Yeah, yeah I, just, I just wanted to uh, to put put that out there in case um, <laughs> in case the jet lag is is coming off in any kind of subtle way. I'll and do so, my best to uh, accommodate for that. <laughs> yeah, man. So I wanted to start with uh, kind of your background um, mm-hmm. and where you're from and all that sort of stuff because um, I'm always interested in kind of uh, where people come from and how they make it to new york especially because new york uh, is just a complete mixed bag of people from every location so um what is uh, is your story of how you arrived there um yeah grew up in lexington massachusetts um started playing piano when i was four years old my uh mom was a an amateur piano player when she was growing up um very good very talented um, I only use the word amateur because she didn't decide to go uh, professional. She just um, decided to get a degree in physical therapy instead. Um, and uh, my parents are from South Africa, so they emigrated uh, to the United States in 1988. And with them, they brought my mom's dad's piano that she had grown up playing. And he passed away before I was born, but I was named for him. Um and my mom always tells the story like I was always just drawn to this instrument, <clears throat> was playing it from a young age, um, showed interest in being musical. And my mom, being uh, talented as she is, um, and also just a hilarious person, pretty much started giving me ear training tests in the car when I was a kid <laughs> um, and would have me listen to orchestras and say, like, can you tell, like, what instruments are playing now? Like 
is it loud is it soft like starting off like basic questions and then like maybe humming a note and saying like do you know like what instrument is playing that note so i was kind of just around music from from a very young age and my dad um was in well he is an optometrist but when he was growing up he was in a wedding band um <clears throat> as a drummer and so uh he's you know my both my parents kind of have musical um capabilities and um affinities and even though i didn't grow up in a strictly musical household i've been around it for my entire life so even in my fifth grade yearbook i'm pretty sure actually i'm 100 percent sure i literally wrote either i wanted to be a professional baseball player or a professional jazz pianist so composer arranger orchestrator not so far off from the original fifth grade goal um and yeah you know I had a pretty good high school program, middle school that was affiliated with the high school. And I grew up with, um, actually someone who I saw was on your podcast already, Raviv Markovitz. Yes. We've been friends since we were four years old. Um, so we just grew up like playing music together and, um, uh, fortunately, um, and, you know, being friends and playing music together is always a really good combination, um, of things to happen. And so when I moved to New York, um, you know, I was going to NYU originally. I was actually studying pre-med and um, jazz side by side. Um, so I had this built-in community at NYU of jazz people and also had a pretty good, um, there's an amazing faculty there of inspiring educators. People who I studied with were like, my first teacher was Don Friedman. Then I studied with Brian Lynch, um, then Jean-Michel Pilk, and finally with Gil Goldstein. Um, so, um, those people, you know, Don Friedman, obviously like one of the most heralded pianists, um, on hundreds of recordings, um, pretty much a, a legend, um, Brian Lynch, you know, played with the messengers band. Um, both of those guys really helped me get my chops together in terms of knowing my history and learning a lot of language. Jean-Michel Pilk, um, was awesome. I mean, he's... I think literally a rocket scientist. I think that he was working as a scientist um, and then he became a pianist later on in his life. I don't know if that, I mean, pretty sure that that's true. We'll have him it on sounds, the podcast. We'll get him to clarify. It sounds ridiculous though, but I'm pretty sure that's true. Anyway, he, you know, studied like more like of the philosophical side of music. And then when I studied with Gil Goldstein, we were studying um, Gil Evans scores and, um, you know, studying Gil's, Gil Goldstein's own scores and working on my scores. So as far as my musical path with my educators, that was my early formation. But of course, on, on top of that, I was, um, you know, playing around town um, as much as possible, going to the sessions. Um, when I was a freshman, I was going to the sessions a lot. I pretty much stopped after that. Somehow I just couldn't keep up with the late nights um and you know i had some friends and well, i would play sessions with them on occasion but i was also uh interested in booking my own shows and writing my own music um since before i i came to new york even um but when i moved to new york i just like saw so many possibilities so many venues so many musicians so i started putting together like triple bills of uh, bands to perform together and um, that helped me to connect with a lot of people in ways on top of music if that makes sense you know um, and in 2011 when I was a sophomore I was selected to be I guess in between sophomore and junior year I got selected to be a part of the monk competition um, and whatever connections I had sort of made before then, even though I hadn't won the Monk competition, um, it solidified a lot of those and expanded my already growing network of um, musicians on top of my friends who were musicians. Um, so that's kind of how I came to be in New York, like why I wanted to be in New York and my journey at the beginning of being in New York. Yeah, man. Um, so you end up at NYU, but had you applied to any other schools and how did you decide on NYU? Was New York kind of always in your sights or how did that uh, come about? Actually, um, NYU is probably one of my 
last choices for schools to go to. Um, I always wanted to go to a small school location, and I wanted to be close to home. But on top of that, like location wasn't a huge deal to me, so I didn't apply to any California-based schools, for instance. Um, New York City is about a three and a half hour drive from Boston, so um, when I uh, applied to all of the schools, and I hope no one from NYU watches that and feels like uh, slighted somehow, because ultimately I'm so glad that I went to NYU. It really helped me grow as um, not only as a musician but also as a person and as a professional. Um, forced me to come out of my shell. I'm pretty shy by nature, so. Uh, I'm very glad to have gone there, but pretty much uh, I, I was applying to schools that had dual degree program um, originally between pre-med and music. But as time went by in college, like not only did I realize that I wanted to mainly be only be a musician, um, but I also realized that a degree like or a focus like pre-med because it's not a specific degree. So I guess like a degree like biology or chemistry with a pre-med track was going to take up way too much of my time to accomplish some of my musical goals that I started to have and professional goals that I started to have. So I switched somewhere along the way, um, first to math and then to economics. And um, I uh, never actually finished my degree in economics. I'm one class shy of a major, <laughs> but um, hasn't seemed to hinder me thus far. But I have a minor in economics. My parents always encouraged me um, to do something aside from music, just in case. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I think that's uh, pretty common. You know, your parents definitely want you to um, oftentimes have a, has a, have a backup plan, as, as, as my parents put it anyway. But, um, you know, there's definitely a lot of different ways to do it. So when you're uh, at NYU, your first couple of years, you start to become interested in, you know, composing your own music and all this sort of thing. And um, how does that grow from wanting to just write your own songs, which, you know, almost every musician does or will do at some point? How does that grow into wanting to arrange professionally and arrange for different formats like a big band? And then you later went on to make a septet and uh, all of these different formats. How does that um, how did that grow into that? Right. So I guess when I was younger, rather in like fourth grade or so, I, I had a teacher who was pretty instrumental in getting me to start writing. It didn't start to happen in college. It really happened earlier. Um, and she would have me like write down instructions on like a piece of paper and words saying like, instead of writing down the notes, like how a piece would be played so I could play it identically every time. And then she would have me transcribe um, people in like uh, she started having me like get interested in uh, forms of pieces, um, like on more than just AABA. So I've it's that's kind of like the more I've thought about it, that's kind of where everything has stemmed for me is like writing music. So um, how does it turn into? arranging music is that what was that for for a large ensemble is that your question yeah a large ensemble <laughs> or like a septet you know because one thing to just write songs and and play them right. and, and but it's another completely <clears throat> separate thing to to arrange and especially arrange for a large ensemble um yeah for that you know i had a in my high school there was a septet at like the instrumentation for my combo when i was a senior by the time i was a senior was one trumpet, uh, two trumpets, one saxophone, one tenor saxophone, drums, bass, piano, and guitar. So I was like writing a lot for that group because I wanted to, because I liked to. And I was also like starting to get curious about like how to write for a big band. And I was writing charts in high school, but never felt confident to br bring it into the band to play. Um, but I just started adding more and more instruments, you know, and like once I had my septet, I was like, you know, I'm really hearing more colors here. Um, and then even at a certain point, I remember thinking to myself, you know, like maybe I don't even want to play piano in this. Maybe I just want to conduct it. Um, I love playing piano. I love conducting. Um, it's just two different things, you know, um, easier to 
lead an ensemble and shape certain dynamics, um, cue certain parts, whatever, from the front of the band versus from the side of the band. So, um, yeah. So you're already kind of starting to arrange, you know, for the septet. Um, there was a septet at your high school. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, not identical instrumentation to mine. I mine is um, trumpet, alto, tenor, front line, right. and um, the one at the high school was two trumpets and one tenor. So, was there a particular um, mentor or any books or resources that you were utilizing in high school in order to figure out how to go about arranging for a septet? Because there's a lot of younger musicians that listen to the show and, and watch uh, the channel. Um, who might be in high school or in their first uh, few years of college and <laughs> are, are wondering, how do you teach yourself how to arrange for a septet or a larger ensemble? Yeah. Um, you know, trial and error. I didn't have any books in high school. Um, I think the first arranging book I got was when I was a junior in college. And by that point, like, I'd already sort of figured out a lot of what was being talked about in the book. Um you know, I think that probably from just like having a certain uh, facility at the piano and then like garnering a um, small amount of knowledge of how the instruments worked, you know, how high can a trumpet play, <laughs> for instance, how low can a trumpet play, um, I started to get a good idea of like what what worked and like, you know, because I had already been playing piano at a certain level, like I already had some sounds that I knew that I liked that involved more than one chord. Um, so any advice for people trying to get into arranging, like just do it, try, see what works, see what doesn't work. And um, yeah, what doesn't work is oftentimes more frustrating and more exciting at the same time. Um, you know, don't be afraid to go back and fix, quote unquote, fix um, what... Uh, what doesn't work or even like try and mess with what did work see if you can change how how you did that um but ultimately it's just like anything else the more practice you have doing something the more uh, experience that you gain and the more failures that you um, stack up the more intentional your successes become now, were some of these sounds that you were hearing and trying to attain through your arranging, are these sounds that you were trying to, um, or that you, you absorbed through listening to other similar groups, or were these just things that, that you were hearing um, from, from scratch? Um, I, I think that the first time that I wrote a chart that had the horns doing something different than the rhythm section, I wrote a groove. Um, for the rhythm section and then I realized that I was hearing a melody on top of it and I couldn't play the melody at the same time as playing like the chords in my right hand and the groove at the left hand so I was like okay seems pretty simple let's put the melody in one of the horns um, then I said to myself okay I have two other horns here what do I do with these guys can they play chords to a company can they play pads can they play counter melodies can they somehow color the melody line can they somehow add to the groove? Does the tenor saxophone, like, does the range of that kind of fit somehow into the groove? Can I? So I started to think of certain options. Um, I think that's the first time that I really realized, like, that having more instruments um, meant more options. Um, but primarily, and this is still how I feel about it, you know, when I hire people for my bands, it's all people who are my friends. Um, and uh, I'm just going to brighten my screen here. Uh-oh. Um, there we go. Um, that's too bright, maybe. A little less. Nice. Um, yeah, when I hire people for my bands, I'm pretty much just hiring my friends. Um, and uh, when I was in high school, like, it definitely wasn't anywhere as... I mean, music, to, I take music pretty seriously, but I take my job pretty seriously. Um, but it's still just music. Um, and especially in high school, it was just like, you know, my best friends, you know, 
like Raviv and you know my other it, just because you had him on your podcast I'll name him but like my other friends you know it's just something that we love to do together so I wanted to figure out a way of saying okay instead of just playing trio and like having these other four people sit out like how can I include four more people you know and then as I met more and more people in New York I was like how can I include like several more people how can I include 17 more people so and that's even why I started hiring another pianist in the band is like on top of wanting to conduct I said to myself you know I never get to call my friends who are pianists like maybe I can hire someone for this yeah I'm I'm fascinated by that because I always wonder sometimes when I see folks um you know putting out music for uh for for an ensemble that's let's say larger than than a quintet sometimes I always wondered like and, and, and I know that the people are, are all friends. So I'm just like, are these people, I've always wondered that. Like, are, are these people, you know, partially making this group because they feel musical need to? Or is it, you know, uh, them wanting to hire their friends and, you know, let their friends um, have, have some, some work? I don't know how, how exactly to say it, but um, or just wanting to, to have an outlet for being able to play play with your friends so i'm fascinated by that i think that's really interesting yeah um basically um uh, well actually not sure if that was a question or not <laughs> um but in case it was you know definitely like it's both and the two are not mutually exclusive um and especially like as i started to have the band you know my understanding of what the band can do uh grew and so my need to satisfy some other aspects of like my musical wants um expanded so yeah and but you know when you hire a band like it's you know i didn't create the big band because i wanted to hire more of my friends um that was just a happy side effect i'd say um and it's made me enjoy the process way more absolutely so i also wanted to ask you kind of in this uh, on the same topic where does transcribing and studying scores and this sort of thing where does that fit into this picture of your arranging and and composing development hmm. um well uh it's a good question i'm not really sure um i have a great answer and probably my answer is different from anybody else's answer just like their answer would be different from anyone else's answer yada 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 but for me, you know, it was really, you know, Gil Goldstein, uh, apprenticed with Gil Evans. So he had like handwritten manuscripts like, like of Gil's sketches and be like, yo, check out what, what Gil was doing there. Like even in the sketch, he already knew like what he wanted to happen on, on the, like where he wanted the trumpets to go, where he wanted the saxes to go, stuff like that. So that was eye opening. Um, and then uh, fast forward several years and, you know, I started to receive some jobs that involved transcribing, um, you know, anything from sextet stuff to big band stuff. And, uh, yeah. So I remember there was one project I did. Uh, I transcribed a record called Sonny Rollins and the Big Brass which was with Sonny Rollins and pretty much just brass. It was, um, I think, I, I can't remember if it's three trombones or four trombones, but four trumpets, rhythm section. Um, Ernie Wilkins did the arrangements, and it was just really, really cool. It took me forever to, um, to, get, the, to get a lot of the notes right. Um, but then the second chart that I did was easier. The third chart was way easier than that. And by the fourth chart, I, I really, like, started to figure out like how is Ernie Wilkins writing this how is he making this instrumentation work how is he making the brass sound full and supported and I remember that being like a really really big lesson for me but more than that just transcribing in general is just such a good challenge for your ears um, on top of transcribing you know the more you listen to music the more different kinds of music you expose yourself to um, the larger that your um, your palette gets, you know, like your painter's palette of, of whatever colors that you have, you know, you have your blues, your reds, greens, yellows, whatever, like maybe that's, you know, um, like mutes, flutes, um, 
clarinets, whatever you you know, whatever you want, like thin chords, um, open chords, closed chords, dense chords, you know, polychordal stuff. Um, yeah, and so the more that your own vocabulary expands. Um, yeah, so I, sorry, just a combination of transcribing and listening. It's probably... Yeah, man, I, I would highly recommend uh, those two things to anyone. And, you know, it's something that comes up over and over again. And um, especially in the podcast that I did with Glenn Zaleski, you know, he, he's done a lot of transcribing, um, you know, in, in various contexts. And, you know, and pretty much anyone will, will discover this, but um, he's, he basically put it you, you can spend an hour on three seconds, or you can get an entire solo or an entire tune in an hour. But it definitely gets faster as you go. And so. Definitely mm-hmm. do not be discouraged by it taking a very long time in the beginning, I would say. Mm. Yeah. One of the topic that uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on is music business, because you've obviously had a lot of opportunities to work with your own groups, you know, do stuff under your own name and that kind of thing. Um, kind of the whole leader thing, which most people will know if they've ever tried it is very difficult. It can be very stressful to book a tour or book all these sorts of things um, because you have just so many factors and so many, you know, different things that you need to manage uh, in, in terms of booking, booking uh, your own um, group. So I was wondering if you could tell us uh, what the most important things people should know about if they're trying to work specifically as a leader. Um, wow. That's a really tough question. I'm not sure that I'm the best person to answer that. Um, All I can say is that um, for whatever reason, I was writing music from a young age and that I wanted to play the music and then I wanted to play the music not in the practice room. (laughs) So So I started to book shows when I could. Um, where I could and you know because I went to NYU um, I was already in New York and so a lot of the venues that I was playing at you know I was able to start building up my resume quote you know not that a venue would ever literally look at your resume but I was starting to like build that up and you know build connections and play at places and meet different club owners and just like um, you know uh, build build my, my reputation more than my resume, I guess. Um, and I was also really fortunate to have some really great friends who uh, really pushed me and challenged me to um, create as many new opportunities for myself as I possibly could. And one person who I think uh, actually you've already had on your podcast also, who's really, really great at this stuff is Chad Lefkowitz Brown. Yes. Um, and just happens that like him, him and I are, are very close friends. Um, and, uh, on top of our friendship, our personal relationship, we also have a good, um, business relationship and he's very, very, um, forward thinking in, in these, uh, regards. And, um, if I ever have a question, I usually go to him. So I'd, um, recommend that anybody who has just seen you ask, this question to me go check out that podcast because he's probably the person to ask fair enough man and um going back to the the composing and arranging topic i wanted to ask you um is it possible to distill a a set procedure for writing for a big band does it always start (laughs) in the same way with with a melody uh do you what do you write first is 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 there any any particular thing or, or does it just vary yeah, I mean, that's a question that I used to ask my teachers all the time, and they never used to give me an answer. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I, I, the short answer is no, but sometimes, I don't know if that makes sense, you know? Like, if ever I'm stuck, like, I have certain tools that I'll go and I'll I'll look to, you know, for instance, if I'm ever orchestrating um, something r- versus writing something from scratch you know a composition like maybe i'm orchestrating an arrangement that i already have or a composition i already have or someone else's arrangement whatever it is um you know uh the first step is to just start making decisions um you know 
And you can do that one of two ways, depending on when your deadline is. You know, you can start making decisions and just like write into the score immediately. You can start making decisions and you can write it on a sketch pad like, here are some options that I have. Um, and, you know, if, you know, I recently did a project actually, an orchestral project through an organization that I work with frequently called the Catskills Jazz Factory. Um, and they partnered with a festival in Europe called the New Generation Festival. Um, and so I was working on this piece um, for um, for orchestra and and jazz sextet, um, and I had a lot of time. So I had, I think, maybe six or seven pages of sketches for the intro before I started actually writing it. Um, but uh, then I think I was also <laughs> just doing another project that I didn't have as much time for and I just needed to make decisions faster. Um, and, you know, so I, you know, I still, I, I guess like the thing that I always do is I have a written, probably inspired by my teacher when I was younger. Her name was Susan Capestro. She really instilled that in me, you know, having a certain focused um, thing that you can refer to throughout your writing process um, in words, you know, and a form that's, that's probably what I do first. Um, but as far as musical things go, uh, not so much of a defined process, just for me. One thing that I've heard a lot, you know, both from composers, arrangers, but also from people who are writers or basically anyone who's involved in any kind of creative pursuit which requires the production on a consistent basis, hopefully, of of uh, that, that type of work. One thing I've heard over and over again is um, people seem to be the most productive when they kind of almost force themselves to do it, you know, whether it's every day or a couple times a week, whether um, it, whatever the whatever the, the timeline is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've heard that a lot from people that they feel like they're getting the most done when they sit down and write something um, even if they don't feel like it, just to have something out and mm. just come up with something. And then they can, you know, kind of call all of that uh, work at a, at a later point, you know, and come up with something that they're, mm-hmm. that they're really happy with. But they think they, they say that the main thing to do is just to just to start doing it and just to start. Is that a philosophy right. that you adhere to at all? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I'd say that probably what you're really referring to is just practicing um, more than anything else, you know. Sometimes there's like a certain mystery associated with writing music. Um, I guess I was so young when I started doing it that, and I think everybody is probably that young when they first like, you know, you all, not always, but I'm sure that very frequently like some young, early uh, young age music educators inspire people or assign people to write something. But for me, I just, never felt that there is a mystery associated with it. But for those who feel that there is a mystery associated with it, I'd say that it's very understandable. And probably the best thing to do is to just practice it as much as possible. <clears throat> you know, there was a time for sure when I was writing every single day. But now, um, I really enjoy my days off. <laughs> so um, that's not to say that... Um, other times I'm, I'm really, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, there's, a, you know, and even on days off there, you know, if you get an idea, you know, you write it out, but I guess you start to, to develop a sense for what's a good idea and what's a less good idea. Like maybe instead of spending like four hours on something before you realize, you know, this isn't going anywhere, maybe you spend 10 minutes on something before you realize this isn't going anywhere. <laughs> Um, uh, and as far as arranging and orchestrating goes, you know, that's something that you need to practice too. Um, and, um, I can trace my own, uh, improvements or rather just changes because I like my early music too, actually. Um, but also improvements, because <laughs> I don't like my early music too, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah, 
it's just all practice, you know, getting more used to doing something, you know, like if you have to, you know, to a young student, maybe who has to do an assignment for school, if you get a project to write for Big Fan, you're like, oh my God, never done this before. Like, how am I going to do this? Where do I start? The important thing is to just start, you know, do your best to like make something and you can always make changes, you know, and this stuff is fun. It's just music, you know, listen to the greats, try and get as much as you can from them and uh, all the while uh, maintain some sort of um, uh, honesty to who you are as a person and as a musician. Well said, and I think that's a great um, way to kind of demystify the process, you know, is, is just to look at it as practicing. I mean, you have to practice arranging and orchestrating, you know, like you would practice an instrument. So even if you don't necessarily feel 100% inspired, you know, to, to, to write or arrange something that day, you know, it, it will definitely um, be, a, be a positive thing for you to just sit down and, and start and, and just try, try and do something. So, so well said. And um, the last thing is uh, you have recently recorded the first album for your big band, which I'm personally super excited for. And if, <laughs> and if, yeah, and if, I'm sure that, you know, plenty of people watching this have seen, you know, all of the YouTube videos of your arrangements for big band and, and all the stuff that you've put out there, which is amazing work. Um, and Thanks so, yeah, my pleasure. And uh, <clears throat> we're, we're all very excited. So and can you tell us anything about, uh, the record, um, does it have a particular theme or is it kind of just, is it any of the same music that, uh, or same tunes that we've seen, uh, you put out before or is it all new stuff? Mainly new stuff. Um, a couple of old chestnuts on there as well. Um, things from my septet record that I expanded Two things. And, um, some vocal numbers as well, and uh, yeah, um, yeah, I'm very excited too. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm almost finished with the mixing process, and um, I guess soon on to mastering. Um, yeah, so people can expect that out at some point next year i guess yeah yeah at some <laughs> point next year um <laughs> yeah it's, def it's definitely a process and it's you don't, don't want to it's just yeah, a, yeah. yeah exactly you don't want to rush it like you, don't you said rush it. yep um but in the meantime people can always check out um your own record which i believe is is your septet right mm -hmm. yeah yeah um remind me of the name so i don't mess it up yeah it's called peace and time p-e-a-c-e -E. peace and peace time. and time Right on, man. Um, yeah, great album. I suggest that everyone check that out. Um, is the best place to find out what you're doing? Is that your website? Uh, yeah, website, Instagram, um, Facebook sometimes. Yeah. Right on. Yep. All those uh, links will be in the show notes. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's all, all I got for today, honestly, man. This has been really informative. I personally learned a lot and um this is one that i'm gonna probably watch over you know a couple more times and, and see if i can <laughs> can learn a little bit more from you so i i'm i'm totally grateful that you're willing to uh battle the jet lag and um uh interrupt your your cottage cheese eating to talk to us today <laughs> it's uh... hardly even interrupted that no it's my <laughs> pleasure really appreciate you having me i think what you're doing is so cool so keep it up yeah, man. Uh, and stay... hopefully we can talk yeah. again sometime absolutely man stay on the line for one second and uh thank you so much again steven all right. Yeah. Later, Ken. Thank you so much for checking out the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you happen to be listening to this. And if you enjoyed the podcast, consider giving it a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. For more episodes, please visit berniesbootlegs.com. Thanks again and see you guys next time.